Zoe Branch is a small business owner in the United States. She read it and she had this extremely visceral reaction and she said she, yeah, yeah wow. absolutely. I do feel often like um, when I first did a poem on the spot on the street, um, mm -hmm. I was very afraid. I had a lot of doubts. About midway through the year, I made the decision. Zoe, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Ruth. My pleasure. I am super, super excited and I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to have a conversation with me. So it should be good. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for reaching out. Yeah. Now, Zoe, so basically to get started, I would love to ask you, how was your day yesterday? Oh, that is such a great question. Um, I actually had a really specific day yesterday. I was in Boston just for one day. And yeah. I was there because on Monday night, I was doing typewriter poetry at a networking event for event professionals. And oh, wow. so then I stayed the night. And then yesterday, I did kind of a tourist day around Boston. And I had never been there before. I I'm visiting from New York. I live in New York. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just did a bunch of touristy things all day and kind of took the day off from work and then drove the four hours back to the city. So definitely not a typical day, but very lovely and memorable. <laughs> oh, wow. What a lovely way to spend your day. So Zoe, I would like to rewind here and I'm very curious to find out about your backstory snapshots. Now, a backstory snapshot for me, I like to think of it as either moments or events that have shaped you to be who you are today. So backstory snapshots from when you were growing up. So what would you say are your backstory snapshots? Yeah, I would say that a really big thing for me is that growing up, I always had really amazing teachers who encouraged my creativity yeah. so I always since I was little have been a big writer a creative person when I was younger I did theater and dance and singing and all of these things and I felt like my parents my grandparents I'm very close to my grandparents as well as a lot of my teachers particularly when I was young in elementary school yeah. were just very open and supportive of me being a creative person. I didn't really have adults in my life who, you know, told me, no, you can't do that. No, that's not allowed for you. And I know that that's, that, that's a huge privilege as a creative person. I think a lot of people who lean toward creativity have, you know, naysayers in their life who are often just trying to protect them and make them make sure that, you know, they don't go down a road of absolute financial ruin. But yeah. I think that just having these people who were so encouraging of me early on being a creative person yeah, just made it so much easier for me than as an adult to also believe in myself and say, yes, I can work in a creative industry I can make enough money to support myself I can yeah. you know be a writer a poet an artist and that can be what I do and that's allowed and so I would say that that foundation for me has been really huge in making me who I am now I really like that you mentioned that your grandparents now um see I should probably say this because I discovered you on Instagram mm -hmm. and I was watching Devon Rodriguez art. Yes. And yes. he interviewed you. That was so beautiful. And I know you mentioned something about your grandfather. Can yes. you tell me a little bit more about how your grandfather has really inspired you to be doing what you're doing? Absolutely. So my grandfather is about to turn 94. Oh, um, wow. And my, my grandmother also, she's almost 90. And they have been really the biggest inspirations for me. Um, my grandfather 
is he's a very creative person. He didn't work in a creative field. Um, he was a pilot when he was working, mm -hmm. but he has always done this really amazing thing where at any special life event for anyone in our entire family, he will write a custom limerick for them. And then he gets up in front of everyone and he performs it. Wow. So that, you know, any birthdays, graduations, weddings, holidays, like he always gets up and has a limerick at the ready. And so I grew up around that. It's one of my favorite things about him. The limericks that he's written me are some of my like favorite things that I have. Wow. And um, also how I got into specifically my line of work doing typewriter poetry, which is very niche is yeah. I actually inherited his great grandfather's typewriter. So I have the 1931 Remington noises typewriter it was the first typewriter I ever had. Now I have like a collection of more than 10 of them. Yeah. Um, but that was just sitting in my grandparents' basement when I was a kid. And I would sit around and I would play typing on it. And um, the fact that they kept that and then that I was able to inherit that. And then about five years ago, my grandfather got diagnosed with lung cancer. And I was trying to think of something to do that would make me feel better about it, that would maybe bring him some comfort in that moment. And so I ended up taking out his dad's typewriter and writing him a limerick on it and then gifting him to the, or gifting that limerick to him in the way that he has gifted me so many limericks over my life. And that was kind of the first custom poem I wrote for someone. And yeah. now that's what I do. I wrote, I write custom poetry for people on typewriters. And so in that way also, you know, without him or the fact that he held on to his dad's typewriter, I don't know if that is what I would be doing. Yeah, yeah. That is very inspirational. So I can just imagine him just being so touched and moved that you would create something that he was given to you, that you would create something back to him. That must have been such a special moment. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope that it has felt as special to him as it has mm. to, you know, to receive those over time. Yeah. So being a typewriter poet in New York and you actually go out in the streets and you sit down and I love your little box there, custom poets, beautiful. Yeah. And I know that you go and you just sit there. Do you like wait for people to come and ask you, you know, what you're doing? Can you, can you tell me like a typical day day in a life of um, poet writing? Absolutely. So, yes, I go out and I sit on the street. Usually uh, I go to one of two locations, either in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art or in front of Bethesda Fountain in the middle of Central Park. And I have a little table that I set up, a little yellow tablecloth with my yellow typewriter. Yeah. And then I have a sign that's actually the top of the typewriter that clips over and is kind of the carrying case. And the sign says custom poems. Yeah. And I'll just set up and yeah, I just sit there and I usually type away at a little stream of consciousness, whatever I'm thinking that day. It's usually observations of what's around me and I just wait for someone yeah. to come up to me. And that can look like really anything. Sometimes people come up to me before I've even finished setting up and they'll wait yeah. for me to set up in order to get a poem. Sometimes I'll sit there for 30 minutes and nobody comes up to me. And it really, it's really hard to know what will happen when I go out. It's mm -hmm. totally different every time. But what is consistent about it, even within all of that inconsistency, is that people are shockingly vulnerable when they do talk to me. I ask people, you know, what's on your mind? What could you use a poem about today? And often people will tell me things about themselves that are really personal. They'll tell me, you know, things going on in their life that they've maybe only told a best friend or a therapist. Yeah. Um, and then I end up writing a poem for them in that moment on that thing. And then 
the other thing is that people always surprise me in how generous they are. When I go out and I do this on the street, it's totally by donation. People decide what they want to pay. Yeah. And I'm always surprised at how, basically, how much people are willing to engage and then how valuable they think it is, you know, when they are given the option yeah. to decide what they pay, people most often pay me somewhere between 10 and $20. Wow. And I, I feel like I really get to see the best of people, both in their vulnerability, their willing to share their generosity, their openness, and just their, their, the, the fact that they're interested in stopping and talking to me and getting a poem, I think I see people in moments of delight and healing in a way that that is really special. And I know that a lot of people don't get to see others like that. So I feel like that, I know that that is a huge privilege that I'm really grateful for. That is special because obviously for someone to go and sit there on the street and say, you know, come and talk to me, you like you won't get that same response. But I love, I love your technique, how you know you would be sitting there just waiting and people coming over to you. That is special. Can you tell me one very special connection that you had with a stranger on the street that came to you for you to write a poem for them? Yeah, I actually remember it was someone who came up to me in the first year that I did this. So I'm, I'm going into the third year of doing this. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was sitting in front of Bethesda fountain and a woman probably in her sixties or seventies mm -hmm. came up to me and she, she wanted a poem for her friend. And I, you know, asked her to tell me about her friend. And she said that they had, I, I believe her friend's name was John and they had been friends for decades. They were in a choir together and they would walk around the Central Park in the morning and go bird watching and go to choir. And she just told me all these really beautiful, specific stories about her friend. And it was very clear how much she loved him. And, and then at the end of the story, she shared with me that he had just passed away like a couple of days before. Yeah. And it was interesting because I, she, you know, she was talking about him in the present tense. I wasn't really getting that feeling while she was talking about him. And then when she shared that, it made me kind of realize that it, I, I felt like she, part of her grieving process was that she needed to tell someone about him and she needed to talk about him, not necessarily in the fact that, oh, I miss my friend, my friend has died you know, I am grieving, but just being able to tell someone about all these beautiful things that they did together and these traditions that they had. And I don't know, I remember that so specifically because it was also the way that she was talking about them walking around Central Park and the things that they noticed. And mm -hmm. it it kind of, it, it changed my relationship in a way with the park. Like it, it was early on in me doing it. And so often still now when I am walking through Central Park and I see birds, I think of her and her And I think of the fact that she still, you know, was coming to the park to walk around and look at birds, uh, even though he was gone and... I, people share things like that with me and it's so it's so honest and pure and I'm able to kind of just hold that and I think her story really stuck with me because she was one of the first people who I, I really felt the authenticity and the the need for her to talk about her friend in a way that was just positive and joyful even though she was experiencing the loss of him yeah Zoe you're probably like a therapist like you were saying to so many people the other thing that I was a little bit curious about when you were telling that story is when you're you know when they're sharing their life story with you do you sometimes get like an intuitive moment where you're thinking oh I think this person likes this or this person is a bit like this do you get that 
intuition, uh, knowledge? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it's necessary. Yes is the answer, but yeah, it's not something that I necessarily know I'm experiencing when it happens, mm. if that makes sense. Like often yeah. I'll just, I think the most important part is about l really listening to the person, like listening to what they say and then also kind of listening to what they might need to be what they might need to hear and like sensing what the space is between what they say and what they need. Um, Cause sometimes there is a little bit of a, a space there. Um, it's interesting because often I'll write a poem for someone and some, one of the images I used or turns of phrase, they, they will have this moment of, um, Oh my God, that, specifically resonates with me like the word bloom specifically for this reason I'm doing this thing right now and I didn't even say anything about that and it hits them <laughs> in a way that's like oh I you know I didn't know that or I actually a few months ago was writing poems at someone's wedding um because I do this at events as well and I wrote a poem for I think it was one of the aunts of the bride and I used an image that was like a rowboat and she hadn't said anything about that, but the, you know, all of the imagery in the poem was like boats and water and, and she read it and she had this extremely visceral reaction. And she said, now quickly, if you are watching my channel, small business owners secrets to success, and you have not subscribed yet, please, please, please. Can I ask you to, subscribe and share like and comment if you can do that because it really really helps me a lot and it helps spread the word of how small business owners um yeah can be supported so be sure to do that and thank you once again back to the podcast she owned a company essentially i don't remember what the company was but that the logo of the company was a rowboat and that was the thing that had been like really helpful to her in this hard time, which is what the poem had been about. And, you know, she was really kind of blown away of like, how did you know? And I was like, I didn't know. I kind of just, I, I felt like I kind of randomly chose that. But then I think that's yeah. what I mean in that, like there's a, there's a level of intuition, I think that I'm not even really quite aware of, whether that's luck, whether that's, you know, people, <laughs> people want to see themselves in what I've given them. And I've also listened to them. So it's like, we're both collaborating to come together to be like, Oh, we both want you to like this. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think that actually happens pretty often that someone is like, Oh my God, how did you know that? Um, and to me, it feels like it's been kind of a random guess. Um, but I, maybe that's what intuition is. <laughs> That that is just beautiful because yeah I, I'm glad that you sort of went a bit further into that story because I think sometimes we sort of uh, dismiss our intuition or knowledge or information that we get about people that we interact with mm. and I think you sort of learn a little bit about yourself when you interact especially with strangers because you you know you have no idea who they are and you know they could just be either walking past or giving you like a smile or whatever and you sort of pick up a few things so that's great that you're making a good use of your your gifting in that special way and I'm, I'm I can just imagine people going away just being blown away by your yeah your gift so good on you yeah Thank you. I think it also <laughs> I think there's also a big part of it that is just that there are so few spaces where we are able to connect authentically with strangers. There are so mm. few where it feels like we're allowed or where it's acceptable for you to be vulnerable with someone that you don't know. And so I think, yes, there's a level of, of intuition, but also I think people just, people are just refreshed by the fact that the space is there at all. And it's less about necessarily, you know, how amazing or groundbreaking the poem is. The poem is more of 
the purpose of the poem is that it's kind of a receipt of the fact that, you know, we had this interaction and you hopefully felt seen and heard in it. And the poem is like proof of that. And I think people, you know, we are just getting so more and more divided and it's it feels harder and harder to see the ways that we are alike. It feels so easy to find all the ways that we're different. And so I think when people do find a space where they feel like they can connect with someone they don't know and they're able to be reminded of the fact that, you know, we're all humans, we're all worrying about the same things, we're all joyful about the same things. Yeah. You know, I think it brings us back to that place of being like, oh, okay, you know, the world is big and bad and scary, but also we're all just little creatures and yeah. we all have the same hopes and fears and dreams and need to connect. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I guess uh, this is a great time for me to go to the next question because I know back in 20, so before 2020, you were not doing this time. Mm. You were not doing this at all, were you? Can you tell me what you were doing before that? Because obviously COVID happened in 2020. Can you yes. um, take me back a bit further? Absolutely. Um, so I used to work in journalism. That was my career before COVID. And I had kind of a typewriter poetry side hustle business that I started at the end of 2018 but I wasn't doing poems on the spot then. I would type up so sometimes my own poems, other people's poems um, who I who were in my community and who I was paying for their work. And then, you know, just public domain poems that I liked and wanted to disperse. And I would type them up on a on my great grandfather's typewriter and mount them with pressed flowers and sell them at night markets and things like that. So I was doing that on the side and then I was working in journalism full time. I worked at a small media company in Tacoma, Washington, and I was just I was doing kind of lifestyle and business um, print magazine journalism. So, you know, nothing super hard hitting or investigative or anything like that. But it was a lot about, you know, profiling and interviewing small businesses and interesting people in town and uh, you know, companies that were disrupting their industries and things like that. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that really explains a lot that your um, passion, you're almost building on your passion and interest. Yeah. yeah wow. Absolutely. I do feel often like um, when I first did a poem on the spot on the street, um, mm -hmm. I was very afraid i had a lot of doubts when back when i was doing my side hustle and i wasn't doing it on the spot i had seen people do it on the spot before and i had this whole story in my mind about why i personally couldn't do that and why i can't think that quickly and i can't you know all the fears like you tell yourself to stop yourself from trying something um but um the first time I sat out and I did it, it really felt like, oh, this is the perfect coming together of all these parts of myself. You know, I, I mentioned I did theater when I was younger. So there's a performance element of it. I've always been a writer um, and a poet. I've always loved typewriters and am pretty good at, you know, typing on one, which is a whole, <laughs> its whole own skill. Um, and then, being a journalist, you know, learning how to ask people good questions and then really listen to what they say and distill that down into a piece of writing, you know, it has elements of all of those things from it. And I felt like I sat down yeah. and, I did it and I was like, oh my God, I've been training to do this my whole <laughs> life. I didn't even know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then, so I guess I can go on to the next thing because I think that's just a beautiful connection there. And I remember when you were talking to Devon Rodriguez, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you met a stranger on the street, I think it was, and this particular guy inspired you. And I want to hear the story. Can you can you tell me more about that um, interaction? Yes. That yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I love telling this story because this poet was so generous to me. Um, I was in Denver, um, which is my hometown, it's where I'm from. And I went to a street market with my mom and sitting in the middle of the farmer's market was this poet on his typewriter with a little table. And, you know, like I said, I had seen people doing it before. I had this whole story about why I couldn't do it, but I was really trying to convince myself to get out there and do it. And um, I was really starting to like toe at the edge of that. Mm -hmm. And I saw him and I was like, you know, I'm just going to go ask him some questions. Cause I feel like if I just had a few questions answered, I would feel much braver to do this. Like, I just want to know some logistical stuff. I'm, I'm feeling kind of shy about it. Um, <laughs> mostly, you know, like, did you ask the people here if you could set up or did you just set up and do you need to have a permit and are you charging people or is it by donation? You know, just these things that I was like, how exactly are people doing this? I would love some yeah. perspective. So I went up to him and I started asking some of these questions and uh, he was being very open and helpful, but also at a certain point I had been standing there for long enough that I was losing him business. And so he looked at me and he was like, okay, you know what? Do you have a typewriter anywhere around here? And I was like, yeah, I actually, I have one at my parents' house. They don't live that far from here. And he was like, okay, go get it. And then you can set up next to me and you can work next to me for the rest of the farmer's market. And then when the farmer's market is done, you can take me to lunch and you can ask me anything you want. And I was like, okay. So I ran home and I got the typewriter and I set up and the first, a, a couple came up to me and asked for a poem and I wrote a poem for them and they gave me a $50 bill. And I was like, Oh my God. It, it it felt like this omen of the world being like, yes, like, just, like, do just, you just have to sit down and do it. And I was so taken aback. I was so shocked. And, you know, I sat and I did the whole rest of the market with him and I took him out to lunch and uh, he answered all my questions just totally openly just was, you know, he didn't gatekeep anything about it at all. Yeah. He was super honest with me. And that was the, like, that was the final thing that I needed to then go back to New York and be like, yep, I'm going to do this. I'm setting up. I know, I know, you know, what the whole deal with it is. I am not afraid. Um, yeah. And I've, I've been doing it since then. And I, I think that I ultimately would have eventually forced myself out there because it clearly was something that I was interested in but he and his name is random his his actual name which also made the the story feel so much more I don't know poetic <laughs> but he was like yeah that's actually what my parents named me it's not even a you know a name that I've chosen for myself in adulthood um but this poet random was just so he made the whole transition into it so much easier. And I've really tried to carry that spirit forward in doing it in kind of, um, you know, if people are curious about it, being open, telling them how it works, giving them advice. Um, there's a few friends that I've kind of ushered into it when they've been between jobs. And I've been like, hey, you can come out here and do this and we can do it together and I believe in you and I really want to have that attitude toward it because someone who didn't even know he didn't even know me and he had that toward me and that has been probably one of the most invaluable gifts that a stranger has ever given to me oh, that is so beautiful and and I'm really glad that I asked that question and I love it that you're paying it forward yeah, I mean, I think that's what you have to do, right? Yeah. And, and then sure, it comes back sure. to you. You just trust that the more you put out there, the more it comes back. Yeah, that is beautiful. As a small business owner, I can I can so relate, um, especially when you sort of look back at different moments in in your journey or in you know business journey and in life. Mm. And you think, yep, that was definitely a 
like a fine, uh, you know, moment, a very, very specific moment that made everything just sort of, you know, roll into place, like the puzzles fitting together. So mm -hmm. I really love that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know this is like all exciting and I have to ask, you know, as a business owner, we all have our ups and we have our downs. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you have faced in your business journey and in life, mm -hmm. well, if you want to? Yeah, I think um, probably the biggest challenge was the transition, the kind of the, the entire year of 2020, um, which I know most people can relate to, but I, that was when I, I transitioned from working full-time in journalism, living in Washington state, um, about midway through the year, I made the decision to Hi there, just a quick little word from our sponsor. Now, as you know, I'm a small business owner and this is my small business, See My Curls. So basically, See My Curls. My small business sponsors this channel. So if you have wavy hair, curly hair, coily hair or locks and you like to try some natural handmade and organic products, be sure to check out seemykels.com.au and I hope that will inspire you to continue your curly hair journey. And yeah, let me know how you go. You can either follow me on my See My Curls Instagram page or you can follow me at my Instagram page as well for these channel all right back to the podcast about midway through the year i made the decision to leave that job because it wasn't a good fit for me anymore um and then i moved to new york city and i decided to give myself one year essentially to figure out if i could replace my income with my business income and at that point still i wasn't quite doing um street poems yet i started doing on the spot typewriter poetry around april of 2021 so there was about a year um when i felt i had made this huge decision uh that many times felt like it hadn't been very smart <laughs> and uh you know it had been this big risk and i spent most of that year kind of you know, working on my website and on taking better pictures of my products and trying to figure out how to use TikTok to promote my business without going mad, which was not possible. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would say that that entire year, essentially there was an entire year where I felt very lost and I felt very uncertain if I had made the right choice. And, you know, I was kind of thinking, well, maybe I should start looking for other journalism jobs. Maybe, you know, I should start doing some freelancing or some copywriting. And I dabbled in those things and, you know, none of them really went anywhere. And I kind of just had to, I don't know, stick it out long enough. Like I'm, I'm really glad that I at least trusted myself enough to give myself that entire year. Because if I think at the six month point, if I had judged myself based off of where I was able to get in six months, then, uh, you know, I would have given up and I would have just gotten any job I could have gotten. Um, but the fact that I intentionally gave myself the year, it was almost like right at the very end of the year, that's when I started doing street poems and being successful with that. Also shortly thereafter, I got um, recruited by an agency that essentially hires out typewriter poets all over the world to do events. And um, so they're called Ars Poetica and they asked me to be on their roster shortly after I started doing street poems. And then I started work, working with them more and more. I'm now the director of sales of that agency and kind of like a core member of it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I ended up like started to have some success on social media. Like it felt like right at that year mark was when things really started to pick up. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe this is going to work out after all. But 
all the way leading up to that for that year when I was, you know, I was technically unemployed, but being like, I'm full-time self-employed. I'm not thinking of myself as unemployed. I'm thinking of myself as like giving myself a year to build this business. Um, I would say for 10 and a half months, <laughs> I was really, I was working harder than I've ever worked um, on, on the business, but I really didn't know if it was going to if it was going to work out. And I was kind of looking at that year deadline and being like, oh, I, I don't know about this. And then everything kind of took off at once. It was like that whole year's worth of work that I put in paid off, you know, within one month, essentially, right at the end. Um, but yeah, that was a huge lesson to learn because, you know, I've had smaller periods of that since then in the last uh, two and a half years. And, um, you know, a month or two that's really slow or especially doing uh, poems on the street, it's very weather dependent. So, you know, it can, be, it can sometimes have like a couple of really slow, hard months. Um, but then I remind myself that maybe the third month after that will be the best month I've ever had. And it will all yeah. even out over time. So that was a really good lesson to learn like right at the beginning yeah yeah lovely so um, i'm like nodding away going yep yep i understand i can relate definitely and having a small business and especially you know starting one up and everything else like you learn so much about yourself you learn about mm -hmm. you know what you can do what you can't do i guess in those sort of moments, sometimes you have to wear so many different hats, right? And you've mentioned um, some of the hats that I can go, yep, I've done that. So you you did website, uh, you were setting up your website. Can you tell me some of the different hats you've had to wear in your business? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess web developer. <laughs> um, yeah photographer, um, copywriter, editor, um, financial person. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've always, I've always done my own books and so figure and figuring out, especially in the U S um, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but our tax system is a real nightmare specifically for self-employed people. So, you know, I've done a lot of classes on how, taxes work so you know wearing that hat um yeah I, writer I, social media person <laughs> you know yes. video editor really like and all the things that go into it uh you know you're doing it all on your own and it, it is really interesting how that is both so empowering and overwhelming and you know I think sometimes I have to I put too much pressure on myself of being like well I should be able to do this myself and I'm kind of now just getting to the part of it where I'm like I don't have to do every single thing I can look at the things that are like this is interesting to me I am good at this and then the things that aren't that I'm allowed to let someone else do it. And I'm kind of going through that transition right now, which is interesting because there's also when you have been doing all of it, and I don't know if you experience this, but you almost, even if you really don't like doing it, you're like, oh, but I need to be the person in control of this. Like it's my business. I, I want to be able to like know all the different things. And yeah. so letting go of that control when you have been the only one. Um, mm. So a whole different kind of hat to learn how to wear, how to be a, a delegator. <laughs> precisely, precisely. I love that. And again, I can relate. I've been running my small business for the past 10 years while looking after kids and teaching and all that. But yeah, I can definitely understand. And it took me, to be honest, I think eight years to finally say, okay, I can delegate. I can find <laughs> some freelancers 
who are happy to sort of help and I guide them. I'm very specific and sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, you just show me what you can do. So, yes, I can yeah. definitely relate. And it's, um, it's interesting. It really teaches you about a lot about yourself, doesn't it, having a small business or, you know, having a business, isn't it? Yes, I think it's it, it's it's the hardest and most rewarding thing I've ever done. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. And I like to go a little bit into social media because mm -hmm. I think every business owner is either a love-hate relationship, it's a relationship that I can say it goes up and down almost every few days or every week or every month where you're like, oh, my goodness, I don't know what to do. Can yeah. you um, tell me your process of, hand, you know, handling, yeah, everything to do with social media? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I am at a point right now where I essentially have no process, <laughs> um, but I've gone through all these different iterations of my relationship with social media, with my business. Um, when I first started my side hustle in 2018, I started my Instagram account, Flora and Phrase, along with that. And, you know, I would just post my products on there. I would post when I was going to be at the night market. And the first probably thousand or so followers I had on there were just people in the community who, you know, discovered me through the night market or bought something off my Etsy page. Um, and I was really just, you know, using it almost as an extension of my website, but I didn't really have necessarily any goal to grow it that much. I, it just felt like, oh, I should have some kind of social media presence. And I think that it was also before reels or anything like that existed. Um, and then it started to feel like a more valuable it, it's something that I put a lot of time and effort into starting in 2020, kind of at the beginning of that year of, oh my God, what am I doing? It felt like, oh, I really need to focus on social media because how else, you know, I'm, I'm new in this huge city. Um, I, you know, everyone is at home. There's not a lot of like in-person networking or like meeting of new interesting people going on. So it was like social media became kind of like the end all be all it felt of like the sink or swim of my business. And yeah. so around that time is when I, I started to be like, okay, I don't really know how to grow organically on Instagram. It seems like TikTok is really the platform for that. So I got on TikTok and I was putting a ton of time into making content. I was filming myself, you know, make every single piece that I sent out in the mail. Um, and then in about, I, in kind of the um, spring of 2021, kind of similarly to like when these other things started to get some headway, I had a, a couple of videos do pretty well on TikTok of me, just the process of me making a few pieces. And I got a, a lot of sales out of them and I was like, oh great, okay, this is working. But then on the flip side of that, I also saw kind of the um, the difficulty of once, especially I think on TikTok, TikTok is so, um, it's such a feast or fam famine platform. It's really, you're either kind of on there giving your whole soul to it and not getting anything from it. And then when it decides to give you some attention, it's too much attention for one person. It's like the first time I had a video do well on there, it was like, it was just before Mother's Day and I got like a hundred orders overnight. And at first I was like, oh, this is so exciting. My video went well. I've been like working for six months tirelessly every day to have this happen. And then yeah. it happens. So oh my God, I'm one person and I need to make these hundred orders in the next like three days to get them to people in time for Mother's Day. So I, you know, was up all night and making all these things and it was very exciting and it was very stressful. And I was like, wow, that was really incredible. What a powerful tool that is. And also 
the fact that you have no control over when it is going to succeed or not, and you're kind of at the whim of that, was really an intense feeling. And I'm glad that I experienced that a little bit that spring because the following fall, a video of me doing street poems, like the, it was me writing for a high school sweetheart couple and um, someone that I was working with at the agency filmed it and put it on TikTok. And for whatever reason, however the algorithm decides anything, it went super viral. It ha has like around 11 million views. And that was, it. that experience was actually, it was again, exciting. It was good for putting me and my business on the map. I still sometimes when I'm out doing poetry get recognized in that video. And it was also totally, it was extremely overwhelming. It, like we are not built to be seen by that many people at once and like perceived by that many people. And, yeah. and it was this, the lack of, it was like, oh, suddenly this is happening to me. And it's very exciting, but I also have kind of mixed feelings about it, which I don't even really know how to talk about. And after that happened, it kind of, changed my relationship with social media and specifically TikTok. Like I, I haven't really posted on TikTok in almost two years. I think because it made me realize that I, I just so prefer kind of the in-person, like real life face-to-face. -face. I am a person, you are a person, we are two people connecting. Because yeah. on the flip side of that, I am like a 60 second version of myself that 11 million people are consuming and I'm not actually part of that equation. I become like a whole other entity, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like a caricature of myself almost. Yeah. And I, actually, I really didn't like that feeling. It, it felt so different than like, it felt like the antithesis of sitting on the street with one person in front of me writing a poem for that person. And so, you know, that's not to say that I'm not grateful for the exposure and the business that that experience brought to me, but it made me realize that that's not necessarily the, you know, continual experience that I want to cultivate. Like that's something that is interesting about, you know, Devon Rodriguez, who is, an extremely talented artist and has really made a name for himself mainly on TikTok and has millions of followers. And it's amazing how he's made that work and how he has stayed humble and how he has stayed, you know, true to himself as an artist. And also, you know, I think that would probably be a very difficult thing to grapple with. It's like, mm. it becomes, a part of you in a way that you're like, oh, I was using this as an advertising tool for me and my art. And now my art is the advertising tool. Now I am the yeah. advertising tool. And so I feel like I have a little bit of a complicated relationship with that. And I now the way that I use Instagram um, and my Instagram has grown a lot from that, you know, that viral TikTok video from being painted by Devon. Um, but I really use my business Instagram account almost as a personal Instagram account. And I, I post my poetry on there. I post, you know, just myself and my life. And I try to be authentic and grounded and who I am. And I try to use it in a way that is not necessarily like, Ooh, what's my business strategy in this, but just kind of like, how can I show up here authentically in a way that doesn't require a ton of extra work from me it's just me showing up online in a way that feels true to myself and mm -hmm. if people like that then they'll probably you know if people like me they'll probably like my business they'll probably like my poems they'll probably like what I do and so I try to just kind of show up on there as a person and not worry that much about how much you know if that's going to make me sales or if it's going to 
make me likable. Um, I kind of just try to hope that the people who follow me are there, you know, because they think what I do is cool and they they care about me as a person, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing all that because, like you said, there is that positive pros and cons really, isn't there? And each to their own, like we all have to sort of uh, decide, is this something that is making me feel good about myself or is it something that is stressing me out? And I love it that you were able to, you know, discern and say, yep, this is something that doesn't make me feel good. So I don't think I want to explore that further and I want to do something that makes me feel good and connect to to people and I have to say that I definitely saw that so after watching Devon's um you know conversation with you I went straight to your page of course and I I went through and I went oh she's such a beautiful person I love the way like your personality really shines through your social I have to say and Thank so you. I was able to straight away connect with you and then, um, yeah, and I just love how you do your you know, behind the scene and you show, you take us through your journey, through your life. And I love the one where I think you took us, you went to an event in, I think, New York and you were, um, I think the group of people, they were talking about work and you, like you had to write poems for them and at the end you read that poem. Can you tell me your experience that day? Sure. Yeah. So I was, um, that was probably about a month ago and it was, it was an event for, um, hotel professionals. So people who work in the hotel industry and okay. this, uh, this brand, one of the hotels essentially had put together an industry night for them. There were probably about 30 people there and they had hired a facilitator who kind of you know, facilitated some conversations about gratitude and growth and, you know, what they love about their work and what they want to change about their work and connection and all these things. And they had this beautiful dinner. And then part of the kind of gratitude conversation was you could come over and get a poem from me. And so I wrote poems for everyone. And then at the end, uh, the facilitator he had had everybody write one word on the wall with a piece of chalk and the word was supposed to represent kind of what they were feeling in this moment and the words were all over the place the words were you know exhausted hopeless uh joyful connected disconnected like at every word was you know it was like the whole uh, spectrum of human emotion was shining in the room and um, and he asked me to look at the wall and to write a poem about that about the words that I saw there and um, you know how that impacted me and also it was interesting to see the words because I, I interacted with most of the people at the event and then to see you know that also the difference between how we face outwardly and how we interact with others mm -hmm. versus, you know, if you are asked to choose one word of how you are truly feeling right now, you know, it's probably going to be something that the people around you can't necessarily tell from the way that you're acting. And so it was really interesting interacting with all these people, writing poems for them, and then looking at their words on the wall and being like, wow, these are so you know, nobody came up to me and asked me to write a poem about how exhausted they were, for example. <laughs> um, but they're exhausted and they're feeling that. And that's like the main thing that they're experiencing. So then I wrote a poem for the true feelings, essentially, that people had written on the wall. And yeah. I read that out in front of everyone at the dinner. And it was kind of a, it was a really nice way to tie up the whole experience of like, that those feelings, even though they hadn't expressed them outwardly to anyone, were still, you know, fair and valid and welcome, um, even if they yeah. were, you know, not like warm and fuzzy emotions. So yeah, that's like, an, that's an example of the kind of um, event that I work through the agency, Ars Poetica. I do 
weddings, corporate events, baby showers, the whole gamut of any wow. kind of event. And that was a really special one because it was so thoughtfully curated. Um, and I felt like the, the poetry element fit really nicely into what they were trying to get out of the whole evening. Mm, lovely, lovely. So I can just imagine that sort of like an event where people go and Hey, guess what? Someone's, you know, someone writes poems. Would you like a poem written? I can just imagine people going, oh, okay. So, yeah. So I guess the next thing I want to ask is work-life balance. And a lot of business owners, they have a very different take on it. Some people can say, yes, I have a work-life balance and this, this and that. And some people can go, well, I just go with the flow. And um, yeah, so what is your work-life balance? What does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say that is something that I always need to be trying harder to establish probably. Although I will say when I was working full-time in journalism, I had a way worse work-life balance, maybe in part because I also had this business on the side and I was juggling all these things. And um, I definitely skew kind of naturally toward workaholic mode. Um, you know, I think a lot of people who are business owners do because you have to have some of that in you to start a business at all, I think. Um, yeah. But I would say um, my work-life balance is probably better than it has been at most other times in my life, which is not to say that it's amazing. Um, I think the thing that I struggle with most right now in terms of balance is that, especially with doing the street poems, um, it is one of those things that I kind of can go and do any time, especially if it's nice outside. And the trap that I kind of find myself in sometimes is that every time there's a nice day, I'm like, oh, I should be out on the street doing poems. And that would not be sustainable for me to do that. But it's almost like I have, my brain is associating beautiful weather with working, which I'm trying <laughs> to do because obviously I want to also allow myself to so, you know, on a sunny Saturday, be like, I'm going to go to the beach with my friends today. I don't have to go do poetry on the street, but it's really like, I, I feel guilt around that, or I feel a lot of shoulds mm -hmm. I should be doing this. Um, I think that I, you know, despite that am better than I have been at other points in my life in saying, you know, I'm not I'm not working today. I'm going to go do something else. I have the flexibility to do that. I'm self-employed. There's so many, you know, little cons that come with that, little annoyances. I might as well allow myself to fully take advantage of the pros. And one of the pros is flexibility, getting to decide your own schedule, getting to say, you know, you started this conversation off with what I did yesterday. And I was like, oh, I just, I was walking around Boston at 1 p.m., it was a nice day. I didn't check my email all day. I didn't do any work, um, mm -hmm. which is not something that I could do if I wasn't a small business owner. So I think I've gotten better at allowing myself to do things like that. And I would always like to be getting a little bit better at that. But also, you know, I want to recognize that I've come very far. Um, mm as well oh lovely yes it really is very very important to to I find to be flexible as well as sometimes strict and I think that balance again it's um it's very unique to each person and I and I really love that you've um yeah you've got that going and you know how to to um deal with that that is really good so you were talking about friends and you know you're able to say yeah I want to go for a walk with my friends I want to do this with my friends have your friends and families been very very supportive of your business um do you find that they yeah do they celebrate your success with you yes I I think I 
am extremely fortunate in um, when I first started my business, my friends particularly were so, you know, my friends were kind of the people who made me realize that I even had, that I had even started a business because I had written this poem for my grandfather and I posted that on my personal Instagram page at the time. And I got this huge influx of messages from my friends being like, oh my God, I love this. Will you write me a poem for my mom? Will you write a poem for this person? Will you like type up this poem that I love? Um, and enough of my friends kind of reached out to me in that way that it made me realize, oh, this is resonating with people. People want, you know, I I haven't, I thought that I was just making a gift for my grandfather. And then it turned out that everyone mm -hmm. around me kind of like wanted a similar thing. And so I, my friends have been hugely supportive. And, you know, once I did start my business where you, like so many people in my life have always, you know, around holidays, around birthdays, bought from my business, supported me, um, come visited me at the night market when I was doing that. Um, and, and yeah, and my family has been as well. It, I think most other people in my family have taken a, a more traditional career path. Um, my brother works in computer science. My dad does as well. You know, like they have these like stable nine to five jobs that are like not yeah. outwardly creative. Although I think I do think there's a lot of creativity that goes into that kind of work as well. Um, mm. and, but I've been so lucky that despite, you know, they're not really being m many other people in my family who have, uh, pursued a creative path that mm. I, I don't feel that I've been met with, you know, misunderstanding from my family. I think that my family has been supportive and trusting of me that I will figure it out. And that I, I think they trust that I'm the kind of person who will land on my feet and having that trust from them and feeling that I think has been one of the things that has helped me land on my feet when I wasn't sure if I would. Um, and like I said at the beginning, the fact that my family has always been supportive of me being a creative person you know, I went to college and I wanted to study English literature and creative writing. And my parents were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they didn't tell me that I, I couldn't do that. They, I think they just were like, well, we don't really know anything about that or what you're going to do with that, but you'll probably figure it out. And we trust you to do that. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably the best way that someone could support you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Family and friends do play a really big part in, uh, like, in our lives, and especially if they support what you're doing, it's it's like a great, you know, confirmation. So fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually get to ask you this, but how did you come up with the name for your business? So Flora and Friends. Um, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was I when I first started in 2018 i was brainstorming names and it was based off the fact that i was um you know i was pairing these poems that i was typing up with pressed flowers that i had been i i had always been into pressing flowers and they were just in the pages mm -hmm. of all of the books that i had just all these pressed flowers that i had been saving for something and then all of a sudden yeah. i was like oh this is what i've been saving these for <laughs> so i wanted to that that incorporated, you know, both the literary element and the floral element and something that felt like it had a nice ring to it. And, um, you know, through the process of brainstorming several different word combinations and ideas, I felt like that was the one that just had a nice ring and was simple and, you know, captured what it was that I was literally making. Um, yeah. And yeah, so that's that's uh, been the business name for about five years, and it's it's interesting because I still do, you know, I, on my website I still do sell those 
pieces with pressed flowers. I still have all the materials um, and I do get orders for them, but it's definitely become, you know, more of a secondary part of my business. The primary part of my business is doing the street poems, is working with the agency to book events. Um, so it's become, it's not, the name itself is not as relevant anymore because I, mm -hmm. that the floral pieces and the mounted element is not as bread and butter in the business anymore. So I suppose there could be a point in time down the line where I might consider changing the name of it. Um, but, you know, for now, that's been the business name for five years. And um, I feel like changing, changing things is like a whole other topic that I haven't quite delved into yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah oh wow wow when i saw the name i thought you know flora and phrase that is very very you know interesting so thank you for giving me a bit more detail on that i really appreciate that yeah. um so zoe <laughs> so zoe say if you were to start your business like today instead of like three years ago is there anything that you that you would do differently yes <laughs> <laughs> Of course, of course. Um, I think probably if I were to restart a business, I would I would try upfront more so to invest in some you know logistical tools and knowledge. Um, I think that I could have saved myself a lot of stress and sleepless nights if I had allowed myself to invest in some, you know, business education, essentially, right at the front end. I really dug my heels in on doing that for probably about, um, well, probably the first couple of years that I had my business, I was really kind of flying by the seat of my pants in terms of the actual business elements of it. Um, you know, we were talking about all the things that owning a business teaches you. One of them is mm -hmm. going to be, uh, you know, around your relationship with money and numbers. And that was something that for the first couple of years, I was just like, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know about it. I'm afraid of it. But it kept me up at night because I was worried that I was like doing every part of my taxes incorrectly because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and then in that year that I gave myself to grow my business, that was when I was like, okay, this is going from a side hustle to I'm trying to take this seriously as a full-time business. I'm trying to replace my income with this. I need to know what's going on. And so I signed up for some classes um, and, you know, the course of going through those classes, by the end of them, I was like, oh my God, I understand what's happening and I don't have to be stressed and overwhelmed by this element that has really been weighing on me. And, you know, I, I took this like tax class for small artists and it was, I think it was like $300 or something. And I was like, oh God, it's such an investment. But then also at the end of it, I was like, I wish like that was the best $300 I ever spent on my business. Cause at the end of it, I was like, I know what's going on. Like, I'm not afraid of, you know, my profit and loss statement. I'm not afraid of knowing, you know, like my quarterly taxes, like all these things that had kind of been like haunting me in the shadows. And finally I was like, <laughs> Oh, okay. I just needed to sit down and learn from someone who actually knew what they were talking about, not from a Google rabbit hole, which I had been down, you know, a hundred of them. And so I think <laughs> if I were to go back, that would be the main thing that just like allowing myself to be like, you need to set aside some money. It You will thank yourself if you just yeah. start this off the right way and you are not, uh, you know, living in fear of doing everything incorrectly because you don't know. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. And, um, yeah, I mean, we can all, as small business owners, we can sort of all look back and go, oh, my goodness, yes, I would do this and I'll do that and I would not do this and I'll not do that. So it's it's quite helpful how we can analyse our small beginnings, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Now, Zoe, I've, I've enjoyed talking to you and I probably could go on and on and on, but I just wanted to sort of wrap it up here. And, but before I let you go, I would like for you to write a poem for me and any small business owner listening. Is there a chance that you could do that? <laughs> Absolutely. Can I actually go grab my great grandfather's typewriter and do it on that? Oh, yes, please. You go and do right. that. I'll be right here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Wow, it looks amazing. Now I'm yeah. going to uh, make this just on you so we can have a, a good look at it. All right. <laughs> there it is. It's very amazing. Cutting. All right. Okay. Let's see. All right, this will take just a minute. That's okay. Yep. And then, okay, here it is. And yep. I. Aww. And here is the trust you have needed a voice and a song from your center, a soft, gentle light that blooms from your palm. You have held all you need and all you want, always, this soil that asks to be sown for Ruth. Oh, Zoe, thank you so much. Oh, that is just beautiful. I thank really, you. really feel um, <laughs> you have nailed that one. That is just oh, really you. beautiful. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to share with you quickly. So my first guest, because you are my second guest, right? And um, my first guest was a lady called uh, Casey. Now, Casey is the, the owner of a cleaning business and she was mm -hmm. just absolutely beautiful. We, we conversed and had an awesome time. So she has a word of inspiration for my next guest and you mm -hmm. be my next guest, you get to hear this. So this is what she says. And she had no idea it was going to be you. So you're going to be mind blown with this, all right? So just to inspire them in their journey. So is it um, one word no, or is it a sentence? No, it can be a, a sentence, sentence, a phrase. Yeah, okay. a, I know what it'll yeah, be. Whatever you like to inspire them with. Yeah, definitely to be vulnerable. Because I think some of the best parts of our conversation today have been the things that I've shared, um, very personal things about my history. And I think when you share from that place of vulnerability, um, yeah. you have more to offer more more to inspire others others with who might be going through difficulties or yeah. anything like that so yeah to be vulnerable would be my words of inspiration words of advice thank you so much casey and i my next guest i know who they are they're going to be yeah. <laughs> they're going to love it so are they good so much <laughs> yeah wow <laughs> So, so tell me, how does that how does that ring true for you? <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like the, I feel like that's what we were talking about the entire time, and I, I think know. That, right? <laughs> I mean, like that gives me chills in the same way. Like, I think it really goes to to what I feel like I learn from people constantly, which is that people from all different walks of life will come to me and they'll they'll ask for poems about the same thing. And, you know, nobody knows that everyone else has asked that. And nobody knows that everyone else is dealing with the same, you know, joys and griefs. And mm. at the center of that is the need to be vulnerable and to share that with others. And that we all need that. 
And I feel like something like this, you know, from your last guest, like it feels like this almost unbelievable, you know, serendipity of, oh, that really all connects and it all pulls through. But I yeah. feel like that's how every, that's how everything is. You know, I, I feel yeah. that constantly in what I do. I feel I see that in a concrete way. And it's so amazing because it's like just even if you you know, I don't know how you found your last guest, but you know, <laughs> you and I also are on opposite sides of the world right now. We're mm-hmm. and it but we sit down and we connect and we understand each other and what one another says resonates and it feels like, oh, like I I understand you, I see you, I hear you. And yeah. What's kind of amazing about that is that think about how that could you could kind of have that with anyone. And I feel like that's what I get to experience is that if you take the time to sit down with someone like this for an hour, you'll find Mm. these moments of, you know, serendipity, of coincidence, of vulnerability, of seeing one another. And that that can just you know, this is just a little sample size of this could happen between anyone, essentially. For sure. Yeah. For sure. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, I am just, I know when we started talking, I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, this is all meant to be. And what I'm calling it is SBOs, Small Business Owners Inspo. So when mm. she, she talked to it, I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be great. And I said to her, you don't know who my next guest is going to be, but I think she's going to love this. And bingo, it's just been perfect. So yeah. on that note, Zoe, so now it's your turn to leave a inspiration for my next guest, which you have no idea who it's going to be. So mm. would you like to share your word of inspiration for my next guest? Yeah. Um... I guess. Thank you. Thank you. I will. And I think I'm going to say they they are going to love that one as well. So I'm super excited. So thank you very much. Now, before we go, where can people find you? So I will link the, whatever, the links in my description. But this is also a podcast. So you can say where people can find you. So if people are listening, they can find you as well. Absolutely. So um, you can find me on social media platforms at flora dot and dot phrase. Um, and then the agency that I work for Ars Poetica, um, that is A-R-S-P-O-E-T-I-C-A. So you can find that as well on social media at arspoetica.us, which is also the website for the company if you're interested in looking more into what the agency is all about. We have more than 80 poets on our roster worldwide, and we're in the process of growing that. Um, we don't currently have anyone in Australia, but uh, we'll have to fix that. Um, my partner is actually from New Zealand, and so um, I, I might be spending more time over on that side of the world at some point. Um, It'd be lovely to meet you if you're around. <laughs> I will let you know if I, what, what uh, city are you in? So I'm in Queensland. Um, it's a state in, in Australia, so Queensland. Okay, okay. Yeah. good to know. I'll keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's where you can find me online. And then my website is just floraandphrase.com. Um, and I also have a TikTok. My, yeah, uh, on my TikTok is also flora and phrase. And then um, I have a website, zoebranch.com, Z O E um, is my name. And that has some of my writing work on it, kind of from my journalism days. So, yeah. Yeah. Lovely. And you're on Instagram as well, which is the same name, flora.n.phrase. Yeah. Phrase. Yes. Yep. On Instagram. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Zoe. It's been amazing connecting with you and I love your vibe and it's just fantastic. So thank you very much. I really thank appreciate you. you. And um, you nice have an awesome, awesome, thank you. You have an awesome evening. Thank you. You too. Have a have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You take care, Zoe. Thank Bye you. for now. <laughs>